When I was a kid growing up, I had the pleasure of reading both the Harry Potter series and the Percy Jackson series back to back. And as much as I love the Wizarding World, I wanted to be Percy Jackson so badly when I was a kid. I mean, I love superheroes, and demigods were basically superheroes with their powers based upon their godly parents' domain. And to top it all off, they didn't just have those powers, but if you were a major character, you also had some sort of like specialized weapon crafted for the purpose of killing monsters. And that's what I'm here to talk about. Over the near decades since The Lightning Thief came out, the Riot Inverse has expanded a lot, introducing a ton of new weapons, metals, and a handful of new ways to kill monsters. And today I'm going to go over these weapons, specific to the Greco-Roman pantheon, and then I'm going to tell any of the monsters that might be lurking in my audience in disguise which one you should want to avoid at all costs. So, let's talk about it. Okay, so, for the uninitiated, let me give you some quick background about Percy Jackson, so let's start with the beginning. Demigods are obviously children of Olympian gods, so they are half god and half human, and in the story, they are typically called heroes because they can act against both monsters and other gods in ways that Olympians cannot. Half-bloods, as demigods are also sometimes called, emit a scent that can be tracked by monsters, and these monsters have a vested interest in killing demigods because it is the, one of the limited ways they can strike back against the gods of Olympus. While the gods allegedly have their hands tied regarding the well-being of their kids, they don't leave them completely without hope. If you're a child of the Greek gods Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, etc., you are kept safe, trained, and armed at Camp Half-Blood in Long Island, New York. If you were born from the Roman aspects of the gods, Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto, etc., you would be granted access to Camp Jupiter to join the 12th Legion, that is, if you survived the Wolf House initiation. With that explained, I mentioned earlier that if you were a demigod and survived long enough to get to camp, you'd likely be gifted a weapon to defend yourself. The Greek demigods typically received celestial bronze weapons, while the Romans would receive imperial gold weapons. So what's the difference? Well, let's start with the one that we know the most about, Celestial Bronze. Celestial Bronze is the first magical metal we're introduced to, and consequently the one that we clearly know the most about. Celestial Bronze is stated to be mined in Mount Olympus itself, and crafted by the Cyclops, who tempered the blades in Mount Etna, where Typhon was imprisoned before moving westward. And then, the blade is set to cool in the underworld river Lethe. Due to all of these factors, but I believe the cooling in the river Lethe to be the most important, Celestial Bronze has the capacity to injure demigods and send monsters back to Tartarus, as they cannot be permanently killed, at least, not by Celestial Bronze. Though Celestial Bronze does have a downside, which is that it is not harmful to mortal threats. The only exception to that is Luke Castellan's sword, Backbiter. Backbiter was modified to be able to transform into Kronos' sickle when Luke was under his control, and was crafted to be a uniquely deadly weapon, and also a bit unstable, as it was made of both Celestial Bronze and Mortal Steel, which allowed it to be lethal to all of Luke's enemies. But, I do distinctly remember Percy describing the sword as if it was trying to split itself apart, which I've always saw as an analogy to Luke's character. Also, fun fact, Celestial Bronze can be reforged into modern weaponry like bullets, as seen in the Titan's Curse, but they can only be used once and will disintegrate afterward. And I guess that's fair after all, it is incredibly broken to have a gun in the Percy Jackson world, as we saw in the famous Rock Paper Scissors game in Book 4. But with Celestial Bronze covered, let's talk about Imperial Gold. And much like Celestial Bronze, Imperial Gold is destructive to both monsters and demigods, but not mortals. Though unlike Celestial Bronze, we don't 100% know how it is made. We do know that Imperial Gold is able to be forged in Camp Jupiter itself. And we know that back in Rome proper, the metals were blessed in the original Temple of Jupiter. But we do know that the metal is exceedingly rare and has the unique advantage of being buffed when used against Venti or Storm Spirits due to being blessed by Jupiter. And like Luke's Backbiter, Imperial Gold weapons have shown the ability to morph as well. The most notable being Jason's Grace's Julius, which could turn between a Lance or a Roman Gladius based on the way that Jason flipped the gold coin. Uniquely, we've also seen what happens when an Imperial Gold weapon gets destroyed, as when Jason Grace's sword breaks, it explodes and releases so much power that it fuses the sand and rock around Jason into glass. So even when the weapon breaks, you still have one last major attack. Also, Imperial Gold seems to be much better as a fusion metal than Celestial Bronze, as both Hermes and Perseus, despite both being Greek figures, are said to have wielded weapons that were half Imperial Gold 
and half adamantine. And that brings us to our next Greco-Roman magical metal, adamantine. And truthfully, outside of the fact that these weapons seem to be weapons of legend or the past, and the fact that they are very shiny and often fused with imperial gold, we have no idea how strong this metal is or what its benefits are. But my personal headcanon is that when we consider who is using it, I believe that adamantine weapons are likely the strongest and most broken weapons in the universe, maybe reserved just for the gods, and that's why we never see them that much in the series. And now, from the theorized strongest weapon metal to the one I believe might be the weakest, it's Drakenbone, which I know isn't a metal, but just for the sake of the video, let's just go with it, okay? Be cool. Anyway, we don't know much about this material either, as the only hero known with a weapon made of Drakenbone is Annabeth. And despite this, Drakenbone is likely comparable to Celestial Bronze, as its only known effect is killing monsters. However, it wouldn't surprise me if this weapon could harm mortals. And if we ever get more information on Annabeth's sword in the new books coming out, I'll definitely reconsider this ranking. Moving on though, now, just like Thalia and Jason are siblings, so are the makes of their weapons. While Jason wields gold, Thalia, after becoming a hunter of Artemis, renounces Celestial Bronze in favor of silver. And now silver on its own is not a magical metal, but the hunters of Artemis use silver that is blessed by Artemis and gives the hunters monster-killing ability. And much like Imperial Gold, silver has an added buff when used against a specific enemy, in this case lycanthropes or werewolves, and is the only known metal capable of doing lasting damage to them. Silver likely, due to its otherwise non-magical nature, can also be used to harm mortals if directed towards them. Though we've never seen that happen, I don't see why it would work differently. And finally, we come to the reason I titled the video the way I did. We are now going to discuss the most dangerous metal in the Percy Jackson universe, and the metal so dangerous that monsters dare not come near it, and a metal that I believe is a hefty reason why I rank Nico D'Angelo the second strongest demigod in the entire series, and possibly ever. Stygian Iron. So, the underworld is filled with different rivers. We talked about the River Lethe earlier, but none of those rivers are more powerful than the River Styx. To emphasize this, in order to get the Mark of Achilles, or the Curse of Achilles, you have to bathe in the River Styx. So it is definitely the most powerful river in the underworld. And it is in that river where the Stygian Iron Blades are cooled after being forged in the hellish infernos of the underworld. It is a sword so powerful and damaging that only beings like Nico, a child of Hades with an obvious association to the Underworld, could wield it without having their life forces being drained of them. Due to the Underworld being the landing spots for all spirits, demigods or not, Stygian Iron can harm monsters, demigods, and mortals alike. Additionally, unlike the other metals mentioned, Stygian Iron does not disintegrate or banish monsters but rather absorbs their essence into the blade itself, making it impossible for them to reform. Nico D'Angelo is often seen as the second to Percy Jackson himself in strength, and when one considers the weapons at his disposal, it was no wonder how Nico was able to walk through the hellish pits of Tartarus not once, but twice. Clearly, there is no metal more feared in the Greco-Roman sects of the Riordan verse than the ones made of Stygian iron. And I suppose, we, or rather the monsters, should all be thankful that of all the Olympian big three gods, Hades is the one most loyal to his wife. Because if there were more demigods of Hades walking around with Stygian iron blades, they would be in massive danger. Hey there guys, Animated Jared here for the outro, and first and foremost, thank you for watching to the end of the video. If you've gotten this far, then you'll probably enjoy the rest of my content, so if you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. As of this video, we are just two subscribers away from 600, which is absolutely insane. This YouTube journey has been incredibly fun, and your support has only added to this experience. So seriously, you are so appreciated. But now it is time to plug. So let me start by asking you to pop onto Twitter or X and follow me there. I also have my Twitch set up, so be sure to follow me there too, because as soon as I'm done streaming Hogwarts Legacy on YouTube, I'm going to be moving my gaming content over there, so if you've enjoyed that, check it out. Also, if you enjoyed this Percy Jackson video, you'll probably like the last one in which I discuss the reasons there are no legacies at Camp Half-Blood, and if you're interested in the world of Harry Potter, be sure to check out my latest video on the hilarious reason why Dumbledore would hire Professor Lockhart. But whatever it is you choose to do next, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and until next time, peace.